Today is December 13th. <clears throat> it's 11 a.m. Eastern time, so it's time for us to study uh, classical arithmetic. And this is the third class we've we've held so far, and we're in chapter three of the introduction to arithmetic by Nicomachus. So we're going to pick up in chapter three. Um, we'll notice that the first words of chapter three, uh, the chapter begins with, again, to start afresh. So we sort of back up a little bit and revisit the ideas we studied in chapter two so that we can move forward more clearly. So we're just going to pick up with chapter three, and I'll do a quick uh, a quick review of what we studied so far, and then we'll uh, we'll get rolling here. Uh, the goal of the goal of this lesson, the goal in chapter three, uh, which is an important goal, I think, for those of you who uh, are are seeking a classical education, we might ask, you know, where do these studies come from? How do we know uh, what the classical curriculum is? You know, we see this thing, uh, you know, on the academy website. It says quadrivium, and we've got you know arithmetic and geometry and music and astronomy. Like, how do we know that that's actually uh, what we should study? How do we know that that's actually the right curriculum for us? And uh, we're going to see the answer to that in today's study. And so our goal today, you know, is to walk away from this lesson, understanding exactly what the quadrivium is, understanding exactly what classical mathematics means, um, and how it differs from modern arithmetic, modern mathematics, uh, because classical mathematics are concerned with philosophy. So it's it's not the same thing. And you really don't need to choose one or the other. It's not like there's a war between modern and classical mathematics. They're two totally different things. Modern mathematics are usually concerned with some practical objectives, like you want to be an engineer, or you want to be an accountant, or you want to do business. Uh, so you've got to learn what really should more properly be called logistics. Um, that's really what the science of calculation should be called. Unfortunately, in modern society, they use the word math uh, arithmetic for that, which, which causes some confusion and makes us feel like we've got to pick between modern arithmetic or classical arithmetic and really there's no there's no choosing they're two different things and if they were more properly named we would call classical arithmetic arithmetic and we would call modern arithmetic logistics so i've changed that on the study center to try to make that clearer uh, because i don't want you to think that you need to choose between one or the other they're both necessary and you know, depending on what we do in our lives you know i'm a classicist uh, I'll admit I don't use calculus or trigonometry day to day. I will admit that I have used algebra in business. Um, sometimes, for example, um, if I have to figure out a business plan, you know, how do I come up, for example, with a with a number to say that uh, students can enroll for twenty five dollars a month? Where does that number come from? Well, you've got to calculate all different different costs of doing things and what it costs me to run the program and you got to figure all the costs and then figure out well how many students are there going to be and you know how many how many different tuition payments are there going to be and you can put a, a whole formula together using algebra to figure out a business plan to make sure that your numbers will actually work in the end so so i will i will confess that i use algebra in business in even in my work in education to to figure out um what we should charge for different services and things like that. So algebra, even for me, is is useful at times. Um, but you know, higher mathematics, calculus, trigonometry, I'm I'm never going to use those sciences. But if someone's going to go into business or architecture, engineering, um, you know, other things like that, well, then yeah, you're going to use those sciences. So if if that was your goal, you would need to study them. But as I as I've mentioned, I think yesterday. Um, you know, we're humans first. We're human beings first. We have a human life to live. Your your occupation is not going to be your whole life. You're going to have relatives and relationships. You're going to have to deal with your own spiritual life. You're going to have all kinds of trials to go through in life and difficulties to bear through. Your life is going to be much more than your occupation. And so your education has to provide for your human life, not just for an occupation. And most kids you see, they, they get on this track where they're just going to study for what's necessary for an occupation. 
and they neglect all of these more important studies like theology and philosophy. And then when they get into adult life or even even young adult life, maybe even the life you're living now, you just start to run into the challenges and difficulties of life. And if you're not if you're not studying philosophy, if you're not studying theology, you're just not going to be equipped to deal with the challenges of real life. Um, life is really very difficult at times, and our occupation and things like that, everything can be going well. You know, there are times where everything can be prospering and you've got plenty of money and everything is great, but personally, you're really struggling or your relationships are suffering or there's something going on like like last week I had a mother, my mother was in the hospital. And so all of a sudden your, your whole life is turned upside down. Um, life is a lot more than just our profession. So we've got to make sure that we have a, a good human education. And that's really what philosophy and theology are concerned with. And then within the context of a good human life, then we can pursue, you know, temporary worldly vocations and things like that. Um, and prepare for them as best as possible. So it's not a choice between classical education and modern education. It's really balancing the need for both, the need for a human education. That's why those studies used to be called humanities, because they're they're the studies that equip us to live as human beings, that make us more human. Um, and modern studies, which are really more uh, practical and occupational. Uh, so we've got to be careful to maintain a balance or else we'll end up miserable. So today we're going to get into uh, and understand what exactly classical mathematics is. And we're going to see this chapter, chapter three is really helpful because it explains for us this sort of purpose of classical mathematics studies and uh, helps us to keep the goal in view. So we'll go through this, try to get through all of it, but I'm going to talk a little bit um, about the quadrivium, which is the four mathematical arts that are found in the classical curriculum. And we'll we'll read about them here in Nicomachus, all right? So let me share my screen and we'll get rolling here. <clears throat> and I'll zoom in a little bit. All right, so chapter three, like I said, you see he starts with, again, to start afresh. So he's sort of backing up a little bit. We just explained something you know that was important but now let's let's back up a second and let's uh let's let's start from the beginning what we've done so far in in nicomachus's arithmetic is we first started talking about what wisdom is what philosophy is and we said wisdom is the knowledge of real things we talked about what it means for things to be real and i think all of you are pretty comfortable with those ideas they're not that complicated not too difficult to understand Real things are things which don't change. Real things are things which are always going to be as they are. And it's pretty obvious why we want our minds to be focused on those things. That's what actually gives us stability in our life. When you meet someone who's always calm, always sober, they're always, you know, always in a relatively good mood, you can tell that that's a person whose mind is focused on things that are not changing. The weather can change. Fortunes can go up and down uh, throughout life. But if a person is focused on things that don't change, that person's life just stays calm and they sort of weather different storms and um, they're never too high, never too low. Uh, they, they are able to bear with all of the trials of life and, and, and just stay pretty, pretty content, pretty, uh, pretty happy. You know, we see things in the Catholic Church like this, like <laughs> Liturgy of the Hours, for example, which is the official prayer of the church, many people complain about it because they say, oh, it's so boring. You know, it's so boring. This like these daily prayers that are the same prayers every day. It's so boring. I wish it was like, I wish it was exciting. I wish it was like fresh and changing and it was always new stuff. And yeah, that, that sounds good to an immature person who's going to be an emotional basket case. But for a person who's trying to gain stability in his life and peace of mind and live tranquilly, that simplicity and order of the daily prayers is the solution to that problem, which is why the church gives it to us. So the fact that people complain about it, they're just revealing what's going to prove to be the cause of their troubles in life, their desire to be entertained, always looking for something new and exciting, 
that all sounds great, but it's like drugs with drugs. People take drugs because for a moment they make you feel really great, but then they always lead to a crash where, where you come out of that high or out of that, you know, state of euphoria, which is caused by the drug and you end up in a miserable state. And so you, you can choose to live that life where you, you fly high and then crash down to the bottom, or you can choose to live just a stable um, state of life. And wise people choose that stable state of life. And the church provides for that stable state of life, doesn't provide for the crazy people. Um, and, and the people who are always talking about the crazy, they're also the people who are down in the dumps the next day that you've got to try to talk to and help and they're miserable and upset and all this kind of stuff. They, they, they set themselves up for their unhappiness. So we want to focus on real things, things that are not changing, things that are always going to be the same, things that are eternal, things that are not material, because material things are always decaying and changing and coming to, into existence and falling out of existence. We don't want to focus our minds on these constantly changing things. We want to focus on things that never change. Those are what Pythagoras and the philosophers called real things. Then in chapter two, we talked about, well, if, if we, we identify these real things, well, you know, what are they? What kind of things are they? And um, Nicomachus said that, well, there's two kinds. There's two kinds of real things. There are multitudes, uh, which are things that um, exist in collections, like a herd of sheep or a, a flock of birds and things like that, a pile of coins. There are multitudes that exist, you know, uh, that, that exist in our minds, things that we name as multitudes. And then there are magnitudes, things that exist as one. So there are things that exist as one, and then there are things that exist as multitude, as a, as, as groups or, or more than one. And so, so real things can be divided into two kinds, two classes, multitudes and magnitudes. And he talked about that a little bit. And he said, look, the problem with multitudes and magnitudes is that we can't study them individually. We can't study them just like we don't study individual words in grammar. We can't study individual multitudes and magnitudes because they're infinite. They go on forever. Multitudes can be multiplied to infinity. So the study would never, ever be able to rest. There would never be an end to it. And magnitudes, well, we can divide them. Even though they're one, we can divide them into two. We can divide them into four, into eight, into 16. And that can just go on for eternity. So, or to infinity, I should say. So we can't really study multitudes and magnitudes because they're infinite. It would, there'd be no way to study them. So that's not what we're going to actually study. We're going to study the attributes of magnitude and multitude. And he talked about that. And, you know, we have uh, in in language, we've got words for these things. When we talk about multitudes, we, we talk about how many. That's the question we ask when we're thinking about multitudes. And when we're talking about magnitudes, we ask how much or how great or how little. Uh, so... It's the attributes of magnitudes and multitudes that we're going to investigate in the classical mathematics. Um, and that's really where we ended with chapter two. So chapter three, we pick up here. And if you just follow me along, we're just going to read through this. It's a pretty easy chapter to get through, but helpful, especially if you want to understand classical education. So here in chapter three, Nicomachus writes, again, to start fresh, so let's, let's go back over this whole thing with magnitude and multitude. Let's, let's back up a little. He says, to start fresh, since of quantity, one kind is viewed by itself, having no relation to anything else, such as even or odd or perfect and the like. Some things are viewed by themselves having no relation to anything else. But then there are others that are relative to something else and are conceived of together with the relationship to another thing, like double, greater, smaller, half, one and a half times, one and one third times, and so forth. It's clear that two different scientific methods will lay hold of and deal with the whole investigation of quantity. And by quantity here, he means multitude, all right? 
So he's saying that when we think about multitude, we realize there are two different kinds of multitude. One of them is absolute. We, we talk about some multitudes, we talk about them by themselves with no relation to anything else. And we'll say things like it's an even number or an odd number or a perfect number and so on. We're not comparing it to anything else. We're talking about that quantity. We're talking about that multitude absolutely, which means by itself. This word absolute, you might want to jot this down. Absolute in, in philosophical language means by itself. And the opposite of absolute is relative. So if I say, would you like to go to the store today? And you say, absolutely. You know, what does that really mean? That's not what absolute means here in philosophy. When I say absolute me, absolutely, it seems like I mean like, of course, that's what I want to do. That's the only thing I would want to do, you know, something like that. But the idea of absolute means by itself. Okay. So when something is absolute, it's by itself. The opposite of absolute is relative, which means related to something else. So if I said that the number three is an e is an odd number, um, I would be talking about the number three in an absolute way. I would be talking about something, an odd quantity. That's an absolute um, notion of, of multitude. But then when we look at these other these other attributes, and again, notice how we're focusing on attributes, not on the numbers or the quantities themselves, but attributes of the quantities. Um, when I say double, double requires you to have two things in mind. You've got to have two things. You've got to have the quantity that we're actually referring to and that of which it is double. So for example, if I say, you know, the quantity six is double, double what? Double three. So you've got to have both six and three in your mind in order to understand the concept of double. You have to have multiple things. And we're talking about a certain quantity. We're talking about it with relation to something else, to some other quantity. So that's a relative quantity or relative multitude. So we've got absolute multitudes and we've got relative multitudes. We've got all things divide into two classes, into magnitudes and multitudes, or I should flip that around and say multitudes and magnitudes. And then multitudes divide into two different kinds of multitudes, absolute multitudes and relative multitudes, okay? Absolute multitudes would be, would be described as even, odd, perfect, and so on. Relative multitudes would be described as double, triple, quadruple, greater, smaller, three times, and so on. Um, so those are the two different kinds of multitudes, absolute multitudes and relative multitudes. Okay, And so because there are these two different kinds of multitudes, there must be two different sciences which investigate each of these. So there must be one science that investigates absolute multitudes. And there must be another science of relative multitudes. So what we see is that philosophy, true philosophy, is leading us to understand the different sciences that must exist. And this is where the curriculum comes from. It comes from the truth of philosophy. So if we start with philosophy, we start with this idea that, that wisdom is the knowledge of truth in real things. And then we ask, well... Into what classes can real things be divided, or in what different forms do real things exist? Um, Nicomachus would say, well, real things exist in two different forms, in multitude and magnitude. So there's two divisions of being. There's two forms of being. Multitude also divides into absolute multitude and relative multitude. So we can see that there's a number of divisions of real things and for each of these divisions, a science is needed by which we study those things. Um, George, you asked, is absolute not simply denominated? Um, well, if you if you say that something is absolute, uh, and just to be clear, when we talk about things being simply denominated, if you look up a word in a dictionary and there are multiple definitions, that's what it means to not be simply denominated. It means that this word can be used as a sign for a number of different ideas. And so in reasoning, 
anytime that that's true of a word, we've got to make sure that we clarify what meaning we're using when we use a certain word. And that eliminates all of the confusion that relates to the fact that that word may have a number of different meanings. So it's, it's to remove that ambiguity or that lack of clarity that is part of the reasoning process because words having multiple meanings is a cause of confusion and error among men and a wise man will always work to take away that confusion and remove, whereas sophists will actually take advantage of that confusion and use it to deceive people. So the word absolute, like I said, here in this context, it means by itself. Really, that's what the word means. That's the best meaning of the word, just like how Nicomachus um, explained in chapter one that, that Pythagoras's definition of philosophy was the best because it made sense of both the word itself and the thing that's described. Uh, the same is true with absolute. The best meaning of absolute is, is separated by itself. Um, so, so that's what the word means. But like I said, that doesn't mean that that's how everyone uses it. You know, so like I like I used absolutely as an example, which is an adverb. Would you like to go to the store? Absolutely. What you know? What does that even mean, really? Like it just means yes, absolutely. It means yes, very much. Um, you, you can see that sometimes we use words like this. There are expressions, and they really don't even make much sense. So is it simply denom? Is it simply denominated? No. Uh, but I do think that there's a single meaning for it. I just think somehow we get into this modern talk where we just copy these phrases and they really don't even make any sense. Um, and then you said, so like the absolute goal would be like, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I don't really know why we say absolutely. Absolutely. Like, what does that even mean? You know, it's it's kind of confusing. And that's the whole point of 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 language study is to is to get rid of this confusion and and be able to talk clearly all right so the point that i was making was that philosophy leads us when we when we start to investigate and ask well what what are the different kinds of real things well it's multitudes and magnitudes well what about multitudes what what kinds of multitudes are there well there's absolute and relative okay so there must be a science of absolute multitude and a science of relative multitude. So we've got two sciences coming out of this philosophy, two sciences. Now in the next paragraph, we flip to the other kind of quantity, which is magnitude. He says, once more, inasmuch as part of size is in a state of rest and stability, and another part in motion and revolution, two other sciences in the same way will accurately treat of size. Geometry will study the part that abides and is at rest, and astronomy will study that which moves and revolves. So we see that, again, real things divide into two forms, multitude and magnitude, according to the Pythagorean philosophy, into multitude and magnitude. Then multitude divides into absolute multitude and relative multitude. And on the other side, we've got magnitude, and magnitude divides into two different kinds as well, magnitudes that are at rest and magnitudes that are in motion. So when we divide these real things philosophically, we end up with four different kinds of things that need to be studied. And these four different kinds of things lead to four different sciences. And because these are all mathematical things, there's four mathematical sciences. And these four mathematical sciences, which come from philosophy, so we don't just make them up. We don't just say, hey, I think these four things might be helpful. No, these are four necessary sciences that come from the division of these real things, according to Pythagoras. So we've got this system of four sciences. And I, I typed this up to make this clear, and I'll give you a link if you'd like to print this and stick it in a notebook. Let me grab a link real quick. One second. I know you guys love links. So let me give you a link here. Okay. There's a link to this document. And what you see is this is just a summary of what he's just said there in uh, chapter three. Okay. 
So we've got the first two forms of being, which are mentioned in Nicomachus Book 1, Chapter 3. We see that uh, being divides into multitude and magnitude, according to this Pythagorean philosophy. And I've got the description of those two things. So multitude are things that are discontinuous in side-by-side -side arrangement. And magnitude are things that are unified and continuous, things that we would call one. All right, so multitude and magnitude. And then there are two kinds of multitude. There's absolute multitude and relative multitude. And there are two kinds of magnitude, magnitude at rest and magnitude in motion. And because there are four different kinds of mathematical things, four different kinds of real things, that leads us to four different sciences, arithmetic, music, geometry, and astronomy. And I wrote down the bottom, these four arts or sciences are the necessary mathematical sciences, okay? So these are the necessary mathematical sciences, these four sciences. And when we go into the classical curriculum, if we look at the, the Academy website here, the study center, and we go to, class, uh, to the quadrivium, we find those four subjects are the four subjects of the mathematical curriculum. We see arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. So that, does, that doesn't just come out of nowhere. It's not that, hey, Mr. Michael thinks it's cool if we study these four things. No, those are four necessary sciences for anyone interested in studying philosophy, okay? These real things, these mathematical things that, that were described in the first and second chapter, they divide into two classes, multitudes and magnitudes, and then those two classes divide into two classes each, multitudes absolute, multitudes relative, magnitudes at rest, magnitudes in motion, and the sciences that investigate those four different kinds of real things, those are the four mathematical sciences, okay? Arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. And in medieval society, these were referred to as the quadrivium, the four, the four ways, the four paths to wisdom, okay? So that, that document there gives you a quick summary of what... Um, Nicomachus talks about here in chapter three and also what he said in chapter two. Okay. So let's get back and finish reading because it gets, uh, gets more interesting as we go. So you got that in your mind. Give me a yes. If that's clear, you understand what the quadrivium is. You understand what the four mathematical sciences are. You understand where they come from that, that I'm not just making these things up. The philosophers are not just making this up. We don't just think it's cool to study these four things. They're necessary sciences because there are four kinds of real things to be investigated in philosophy, okay? So we understand where the mathematical curriculum comes from, and eventually we want to actually study it. So we're just, this is all just introduction showing us why we should study these things so that we can actually study them intelligently, all right? Let's go on here. Nicomachus says, without the aid of these, without the aid of these four sciences, if we don't study these things, we don't understand these things, then it is not possible to deal accurately with the forms of being, nor to discover the truth in things, real things, knowledge of which is wisdom, Evidently, not even to philosophize properly. So what he's saying here is if you don't study these four things, if we don't learn these four mathematical sciences, it is not possible for us to understand the truth of these real things. It's not possible for us to know wisdom. It's not possible for us to pursue philosophy or to pursue wisdom. It's not possible. So these things are not optional. You can't choose to study these or study algebra instead. This is about the pursuit of wisdom. If you want to pursue wisdom philosophically, you have to study these subjects. And if you don't, you're not going to understand the teachings of philosophy. That doesn't mean you have to study these things if you want to be an accountant or an engineer. You can be a dumb accountant who's really good at balancing books and doing taxes for people. You can make a lot of money as an accountant, but you're not going to be a wise person who is an accountant. And, and being good at accounting, like Pythagoras explained in the first chapter, being good at, account, at accounting doesn't make you a wise person just because you're good at something. Wisdom has to do with the knowledge of truth 
in real things. That's what philosophy is, all right? So without the aid of these four sciences, we're not able to make progress in philosophical study. We're not able to advance towards wisdom. We're not able to discover the truth of real things. He goes on to say, just as painting, in, in other words, learning to paint. So when we go back to ancient education, um, ancient Greek education, they used to have Usually it was, it was always boys that were educated and we could talk about why. Um, don't get into the girl power stuff because you just don't know what you're talking about with, with history. Um, but education was focused for, for young children. It was focused on a couple of things. It was focused on gymnastics. It was focused on music. And then in addition to gymnastics and music, they usually introduced the boys to, to grammar studies and then drawing and painting was important. And you look at this and you say, why would these ancient wise men, why would they make gymnastics, music, grammar, and painting to be the important subjects that, that young boys were taught and made to study? And, well, there were, re there were philosophical reasons for those studies. First of all, gymnastics were not just meant to make the boys healthy and strong. Obviously, that was true. But it was also to teach them all kinds of lessons about the body and beauty and strength and virtue that were that would be learned through physical exercise. Okay, just like we say today, we say, oh, well, it's good to play sports because you can learn all kinds of lessons from sports, you know, to a degree that that's true, right? To a degree that's true. You can, you can learn all kinds of helpful illustrations and analogies through sports that you can then apply to real life. Not that sports are real life, but Real life is what you're practicing sports for, to learn things that can be applied to real life, like the importance of teamwork, how to deal with pressure, you know, all these virtues that are cultivated um, by competitive sports. So they would immerse kids in those things uh, for those benefits. Then music taught the kids the concept of harmony and order and that tranquility of mind. And it was music was also understood to control the passions and affect the soul. And then grammar, obviously you have to learn, uh, you have to learn how to read and write and speak through grammar, learn vocabulary and so on. But then painting and drawing, they were taught as we're going to see here, because painting, Nicomachus says, contributes to the menial arts towards correctness of theory. And that may sound a little confusing, but he says, when, when children practice drawing, when they practice painting, you know, you may just think you're, you're trying to draw a cat or you're drawing a, a tree or, you know, drawing a house or something like that, painting an image or, you know, but what's really going on is that you're learning skills and ideas and you're forming these ideas in your mind, whether it's like perspective or shapes and other things. And those images and those ideas that you're, you're really cultivating as you focus on drawing and painting those ideas are going to help you in other areas of life and so the reason why they would focus on painting was not because they wanted kids to be professional painters or because they were trying to raise artists but because by drawing we concentrate on these things we concentrate and and those of you who have drawn i know that joy i know that joy uh draws and and does illustrating um i don't know about the rest of you um, yeah, but you know, like when you get into drawing, you have to start figuring out why things don't look realistic. And so you start to learn these concepts like perspective. You know, you start to learn how to arrange a drawing, how to make things look more realistic, what causes things to look realistic. If you take a drawing class, you're usually taught to, to study a subject that you'd like to draw or paint and pay attention to shapes, right? You start by Let's say you want to you want to draw a person. You look at the head and the and the body and the legs and the arms, and you you think of shapes that generally represent those different parts of the body. And then you start sketching. You start sketching with sort of general shapes, and then you you more completely customize those shapes to actually match the individual figure. So if you're trying to draw a certain person. You say, well, his head is actually a little wider than other people's head, or it's larger, it's smaller, it's narrower. His eyes are closer together, further apart. They're more round. They're they're more slanted or or straight. 
You start, you start with a general sense of figures, and then you start paying attention to how this individual person's features differ from what might be considered the normal features. But all of these different concepts, perspective, shading, lighting, um, depth, um, relationships between different things and, and figures, it's not just the drawing, but it's also just the ideas of these things gathering and learning these ideas of things then you turn around into another area of life and all of those experiences all of those ideas you find they help you in other areas of life they help you to see things think of things plan things organize things and so on and you learn that by this simple seemingly childish activity of drawing and painting so they would have kids do things like that, not for the sake of the painting, but for the sake of the other benefits and applications of the skills that are gained through that painting. So he says, just as painting contributes to the menial arts towards correctness of theory, so also in truth, that is in the pursuit of the knowledge of truth, lines, numbers, harmonic intervals, and the revolutions of circles bear aid to the learning of the doctrines of wisdom in philosophy. So when you're learning about lines in geometry, when you're learning about numbers in arithmetic, when you're learning about harmonic intervals in music and revolutions of circles in astronomy, those concepts, understanding those concepts, allows you to understand more profound ideas when you get into the study of philosophy or maybe even theology. So you see that these sciences, they're, they're like preliminary studies that introduce you to concepts that then allow you to understand more sublime, more transcendent, more profound ideas in philosophical sciences, all right? So just as painting has applications to other things in life, and that's why we have kids learn to draw and stuff like that, so also the study of these mathematical sciences where we learn lines and geometry, numbers and arithmetic, harmonic intervals in music, revolutions of circles and astronomy, just some examples. They also bear aid to the learning of the doctrines of wisdom, says the Pythagorean Androsides. Okay. Likewise, Archytas of Tarentum, another mathematical philosopher, at the beginning of his treatise on harmony, that is on music, he says the same thing in these words. He says, it seems to me that they do well who, to study mathematics. They do well to study classical mathematics. And it is not at all strange that they have correct knowledge about each thing, what it is, because their knowledge of mathematics prepares them, helps them to understand things accurately. And so when they get into philosophy, it's sort of easy for them to understand because they already have those basic ideas in their heads from their mathematical studies. It prepares them for mathematics. It's not strange that those who have studied mathematics, classical mathematics, they have correct knowledge about each thing, what it is. We find this connection, he says, between people who really do well in philosophy and people who don't. The people who do really well, we find that they always are people who study mathematics first. And the people who struggle and get all kinds of wacky ideas, make errors, get into heresies and things like that, those are people who usually don't have the assistance of the mathematical sciences to guide them to understand things correctly. Okay, So he says that in his harmony. He goes on to say, if they knew rightly the nature of the whole, they're also likely to see well what is the nature of the parts. About geometry, indeed, and arithmetic and astronomy, they have handed down to us a clear understanding, and not least also about music. So there you see him mention the four mathematical sciences, geometry, arithmetic, astronomy, and music. And he says, these seem to be sister sciences. These seem to be sciences that are all related to one another, like sisters. They deal with sister subjects, the first two forms of being. So we see the, these ancient philosophers explicitly talking about the four mathematical sciences, 
and the two forms of being, which we just studied before. He goes on to say Plato too talks about this. Plato, at the end of the 13th book of the laws, to which <clears throat> some give the title the philosopher, because in that dialogue, he investigates and defines what sort of man the real philosopher should be. In the course of his summary of what had previously been fully set out and established, he adds this. He says, every diagram, every system of numbers, every scheme of harmony, and every law of the movement of stars. Notice there he mentioned the four mathematical sciences. Every diagram, that's geometry. Every system of numbers, that's arithmetic. Every scheme of harmony, that's music, and every law of the mu uh, movement of the stars, that's astronomy, ought to appear one to him who studies rightly. In other words, when we study these different sciences, we should understand how they are all part of, of this one truth, this one wisdom, this one knowledge of real things. They should all appear one like part of one system, not like four disconnected, confusing parts, which is how modern education often feels. You know, you go into your English class and you're wondering like, what does this have to do with my Latin class? Or what does this have to do with my math class? And what does my math class have to do with my chemistry class? What does that have to do with gym class? And then there's a religion class that's just like stuck on as an extra part. None of these parts seem to be related to each other. That's a sign that the whole philosophy of the education doesn't exist. And you've just got all of these disconnected, awkward, clumsy parts trying to be glued together. Something's wrong. These things should appear one to him who studies rightly. They should all be understood to be parts of the same pursuit of wisdom. And what we say will properly appear if one studies all things looking to one principle or starting point. For there will seem, there will be seen to be one bond for all these things. And if anyone attempts philosophy in any other way, he must call on fortune to assist him. So Plato says there's only one way to study philosophy. And it's through the mathematical sciences. And if anybody tries any other way, he will have to call on fortune to assist him. That means his study are going his studies are going to be chaos. His success is going to be, you know, it's just going to be lucky. It's going to be a matter of chance because what he's doing has no art or science to it. There's no order. He's just going to have to hope that fortune, capital F, you know, the goddess fortune gives him good luck so he can succeed in his studies. That's not the way to study philosophy. The right way is to go through the mathematical sciences. And again, this is Plato saying this. <clears throat> he says, there is never a path without these. There is never a path to wisdom without the mathematical sciences. This is the way. These are the studies, whether they are hard or easy. <clears throat> By this course, one must go and not neglect it. The one who has attained all these things in the way I describe him, I, for my part, will call wisest. And this I maintain through thick and thin. So that's the word of Plato on the mathematical sciences. He says there's one way to pursue philosophy. Any other way will not work. You'll be like lost in the woods without a path to follow. Um, whereas the mathematical sciences are like going on a hike with a trail that you can follow through the forest. So there's no other way to pursue philosophy. That's Plato's opinion, except through mathematics. It is clear that these studies are like ladders or bridges that carry our minds from things which are apprehended by sense and opinion to things which are comprehended by the mind and understanding from material physical things our foster brethren known to us from childhood because we also are material so we can we can know material things through our senses and these material things are like our foster brothers we, we're related to them because we're also material things we know them through our senses through our bodies our foster brothers 
um, to the things which with which we are not acquainted, foreign to our senses, but in their immateriality and eternity, they are more akin to our souls and above all to the reason which is in our souls. So we move from physical things which are like our bodies in this physical world, which are observed by our senses. We move from them through, through real study. We move from the consideration of those things up to the consideration of immaterial things which are actually like us with reference to our soul. So we move from the body to the soul, as it were. We become more spiritually minded, more intellectual, more like God, more like the angels as we study, when we study philosophy in the right way. Likewise, in Plato's Republic, I want to finish reading this, so just follow with me here. Likewise, in Plato's Republic, when the interlocutor, this word interlocutor, you'll see this, you'll see this often in these studies. It means the person who speaks with Socrates in his dialogues. So there's always someone talking to Socrates. That's called the interlocutor, the person who is discussing uh, the topic with Socrates. In Plato's Republic, when the interlocutor of Socrates appears to bring certain plausible reasons to bear upon mathematical sciences. So Socrates is talking with a man, and the man is explaining why we should study mathematics. He's given some reasons why we should study mathematics, but they're not the right reasons. He shows that they are useful to human life. They're useful. They're practical. We should study mathematics because, you know, they have lots of practical uses, the kind of stuff we hear in a modern school. Um, arithmetic is good for reckoning or counting, for distributions, for contributions, for exchanges, partnerships, and so on. It's good for business, good for financial transactions, and so on. Geometry is useful for sieges when the military is fighting. It helps the military leaders to calculate how they can, you know, take a wall down or how they can defeat an enemy. It's good to know geometry to figure out if there's a if there's a, a castle on a hill, how can we approach that castle? How can we strike it with force and so on? Geometry is helpful for battle. Um, it's for the founding and organization of cities and sanctuaries, for the partitioning of land. These are practical uses for geometry. Music is useful for festivals and entertainment and worship. The doctrine of the spheres or astronomy is useful for farming, for navigation, and other undertakings, for revealing beforehand the proper procedures and suitable seasons for planting and harvesting and things like that, for developing a calendar, being able to tell the time and the seasons and so on. So you see that he's talking about mathematics, this man that Socrates is talking to, and he's explaining the benefits of mathematical studies, but they're all practical material things. And that's really not what they're for, even though they are useful for all those things. That's really not the purpose of them. And Socrates, reproaching him or correcting him, says, you amuse me because you seem to fear that these are useless studies that I recommend. But that is very difficult, nay, impossible for the eye of the soul Notice, not the eye of the body, but the eye of the soul, which is reason, the eye of the soul, Socrates says, which is blinded and buried by these other material practical pursuits, is rekindled and aroused again by these studies, by these intellectual studies, by these true philosophical studies, not by the practical studies you're talking about, but the eye of the soul is rekindled and aroused by these and by these alone. These are the only studies that arouse the eye of the soul, which is a cool phrase to keep, to keep in mind. Not just the eyes of the body, we also have to think about the eye of the soul. These studies, these mathematical sciences, rekindle and arouse the eye of the soul and these sciences alone do so. <clears throat> and it is better, it is better that this be saved, that the eye of the soul, it's better that the eye of the soul be saved than thousands of bodily eyes. For by the eye of the soul alone is the truth of the universe 
be held. So that's again, that's Plato. You know, we, we say Socrates, but Socrates is is a character that Plato uses to present his teaching. We don't really know if the Socrates in Plato's dialogues is the real Socrates who actually said those things, or whether Plato is just using Socrates as a character in his dialogues. But that's taught by by Socrates in Plato that. The mathematical sciences, they, they're they not concerned with practical things, even though they are practically useful. That's not what they're pursued for. That's not why they're part of the education. They're, they're used in the education to kindle, rekindle the eye of the soul, which is more important than the eye of the body. You can, you can hear that sounds very familiar. That sounds like the Baltimore Catechism, that the soul is more important than the body. That was taught by Plato 400 years before Christ. That's not a Christian idea. That's just a true philosophical idea. Okay. So these mathematical sciences, they're not studied for the sake of practical things, even though they are useful for them. So again, it's not, it's not either or. We're not choosing to do spiritual things or worldly things. We, we are creatures composed of body and soul. We do both of these things. We do both. We have to live in the world, and we also have to live beyond this world. That's what human beings are. We're not like animals. And these mathematical sciences are like ladders or bridges that allow us to move little by little from these physical, visible, sensible things to things that are comprehended by, by reason and by understanding, not by the senses. So what you should know, that's the end of what we want to go over today. That's the end of chapter three. So I'm going to stop sharing here and just wrap up real quick. It's uh, 11.56. We're just about out of time. As I said at the beginning, the goal of this lesson today is to be able to explain what the quadrivium is, right? You should be able to explain that to someone. Like I always say, you know, it should be really comfortable and casual. Like if you're at if you're at Christmas dinner in a couple of weeks and you've got relatives visiting and they they ask, you know, hey, Joy or hey, Lara, Sarah, what are you what are you guys studying right now? And you say, oh, well, you know, we're studying mathematics and you know, oh, really? What are you studying? Algebra, trigonometry? Oh, no, no, actually, I'm studying classical mathematics. Well, what is that? What's classical mathematics? I would like you to be so comfortable with these ideas that you can talk about them casually. It shouldn't be something that's like hidden in your room, your private study. I want you to be comfortable with these ideas so that you can explain them to people, talk about them. If anyone asks you what you study, you can explain it to them in simple terms. You know, you don't have to say, well, it's hard to explain. If you, if you can't explain it, then you don't understand it. I want you to, to be comfortable to be able to explain it to them, explain what you study, explain why you study it. If they say, well, how are you going to use that? How are you going to, you know, what are you going to do for a career if you're studying? You know, well, I'm, I'm not pursuing my career in every single thing I study, right? There's a time to talk about that, but then there are other needs as well. But these four mathematical sciences, they're pursued for the sake of philosophy. They're pursued for the sake of the knowledge of the truth in real things. The four mathematical sciences, I want you to know where they come from. How do we know that they're actually real and necessary? And you can also see that, that the great philosophers of the past, Plato, Archytas, um, you know, Socrates, supposedly, if, if what Plato says is true of his ideas, they, they taught and argued that these four mathematical sciences were the only way to wisdom, philosophically speaking. Um, so, you know, if anyone's going to criticize our studies, they're, they're criticizing Plato and Socrates. And I don't think anyone would knowingly want to do that. They don't think they're doing that, even though they are. So that was my goal for today's class. I hope that that's helpful. Um, we're through chapter three now, and as we go, we're going to start moving away from this introductory type talk and getting into the actual study of arithmetic itself. And then as we go through arithmetic on Wednesdays, we'll go through geometry on Thursdays, and God willing, and we make a lot of progress, we'll get into the higher sciences, into music and astronomy. All right? Uh, Lara, what did you mean when you said, unless you're Diogenes? But before we get into that... Um, I'm going to turn off this recording and wrap up this video. And then if there's any questions or issues you'd like to talk about, we can do that privately. All right. I hope that was helpful. God bless.